as much Spanish as I know. <laughs> I'm going to apologize from the beginning because even though I'm used to teaching in a room like this, um, my typical class is an integrated lecture lab where I would teach for five to seven hours a week depending on what's on the class. And out of that five or seven hours, I would only lecture maybe half an hour. Um, today, I need to transfer more information. Lectures are very good at transferring information, but not so good for processing information. So I apologize in advance because I'm going to do a lot more transmission and not as much processing as I would like. So today we're going to talk about, this. in this session we're going to talk about assessment. And um, basically assess is basically learning what your students know, learning how what you're doing is working. It's basically feedback for you um, for basically learning more about your students and understanding how what you're doing is working. And so the title for this session is Assessing Student Learning and Learning Objectives. And Rebecca, who gave the first talk, the first presentation this, mor uh, this morning, will follow up with talk more on evaluation and more about the differences between evaluation and assessment. Now, one thing to keep in mind is when you see a room like this, and you start incorporating more and more active learning into your class, um, you start going for a mode like this professor here, who was actually one of our first scale-up faculty 20 years ago at MIT, that his, his thought on this, I think, is very profound. And that was, traditionally in large lectures, you do what it is possible to do in front of 500 people. And he's not exaggerating. They actually switch from a single 500 student lecture to five 100 student scale-up classes. But his point being is that when you're in front of that large lecture, you basically do what you have to do. You do what is possible to do in front of that many students. But when you have the facilities that are becoming online here at your institution, you really want to be asking the question, what do we really want our students to learn, and how do we want to teach them? Now, Actually, I am going to, uh, just sort of curious. Now, I know at an American university or college, it's very typical to hear conversations like this in the student lounge. I'm just sort of curious, do your students, not all your students, but do some, maybe some of your students express similar sentiments uh, when they have a dance? He has an instructor who's giving him a test next Monday, and he just wants, so he sort of wants to know basically what type of questions he asks on his test. Uh, one of his friends says, well, we really can't tell. Um, Sandra, another friend, has some copies of the old tests. A lot of the problems are straight substitution, basically very short answer. Um, but some of them, he, they, he, the instructor threw in things where the students had never seen them before. Um, things he never talked about in class. And then a third friend jumps in and said, oh yeah, I had that instructor last spring. He pulls problems out of nowhere all the time. Uh, and basically whatever you do, do not ask him what's on the test. Apparently that upset the instructor. Um, we have a 600 page textbook. Uh, according to the instructor, we're supposed to know everything. Else. And the original student goes, forget that, no time, I'll just look over the homework problems and hope that's enough. 
here there's some faculty, here's the discussion going on in the faculty lounge. Um, where one professor is saying basically all these students do is memorize. If you give them a problem that makes them think a little, uh, they're helpless. And the professor the students were talking about says, I don't know how most of them got to be sophomores. Uh, that's second year in the U.S. University. Uh, after my last exam, some of them complained I was testing them on things I never taught them, even though we covered the chapter that had what they needed to know. Uh, so discussion sort of goes on like that to the end. If this whole generation, they want the grades or they don't want to work for them. Now, this, the, I would say every, I would definitely not say every instructor where we come from uh, would have these types of sentiments, but I definitely hear these types of discussions passing in the hall and from some, some, some of them. Not all, but some of my colleagues. I think it's fairly common. And if you think about it on a deeper level, what it really reflects is what we have is a failure to communicate. A failure to be basically to uh, for the instructors to make their expectations clear. What basically the expectations of what they expect the students to be doing and what they expect the students to be able to do. And what the research literature shows is basically the clearer that we as instructors can make our expectations of our students basically the more likely the students are to actually meet our expectations instead of disappoint us. And instructor expectations and track course redesign should start with writing lean objectives. But before we get to the formal process, uh, the more formal process of how we think about the class, I'd like you to think about the last term that you were teaching as instructors. Um, I'd like you to form groups of three or four, depending on how many people are at your table. So with people at your table, grab a, a whiteboard, and before you write on the whiteboard, I want you to discuss with your colleagues uh, one learning goal that your students achieved this past term, and one learning goal your students did not achieve this past term. Sure. Yes. The more likely students are to meet them. Yes. But uh, for example, in some of my classes, what I do is I ask them at the beginning of the course what are their expectations, so that we can all put them all together and our objectives will be able to meet. Thank you. It will be able to meet their expectations as well. Right. So the suggestion was made that it's not just a one-way process. It's not just necessarily. It doesn't have to be just a one-way process. We can also, at the beginning of the semester, ask students what their expectations are as well. Good point. Um, but moving on, let's, if you could, discuss with your colleagues at, at your table. Again, one group of three or four. And I want you each to discuss one learning goal your students achieved this past term and one learning goal your students did not achieve this past term. One thing you want your students to learn you want them to get out of your class that, based on what you're able to see, they were not able to get. They were not able to achieve for you. Um, let's take four minutes. Because basically, if you can answer these three questions, 
that's going to tell that's going to tell me what you're currently actually telling you yourself what you're doing for assessment. Because if you basically if you have learning goals and you're determining whether or not your students are achieving them, what you're doing is assessing student learning. Now I'm going to show you some other other techniques for doing that. But that's basically what you're doing right here. This was just to give you an idea about what you're doing now. Um, so maybe this group could start. And just done all done, basically just give me what so what's one learning goal your students achieved? Okay. So we try to look for uh, I don't know how to do that transversal competence or things like that. Trans That's, transfer of competence. Like we can see in all of the courses we mm -hmm. manage. So we talk about the students knows when to listen and when to intervene or when to talk. Okay. Uh, we get to that because we work we work at children's university, so what we do is we work with uh, students that after some courses go to work with kids. So we need them to know when to talk and when to listen to children. So when we talk about that, they said it happens the same thing at their classes. We also think students can describe the relations between different uh, variables, but what we don't think they, they can do, and we would like them to do, is to think, uh, to have critical thinking, and to apply the concepts they learn at class. Because when they try to take those concepts to some other context, they get lost. <laughs> and, that's, and that's how you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, we talk about that because sometimes when you ask them to, to use the concepts they learned before, in some specific cases, they get lost. So that's how um, that, that, Okay, that's good. <laughs> Um, and actually, what you were talking about talking and listening, I remember a famous quote um, by uh, one of the pioneers in the field that uh, the one Rebecca and I work in, uh, who was basically someone who was training uh, primary school teachers to teach science. And what he said was basically, you have two ears and one mouth, and you should use them in that proportion. We probably have you probably have a more formal system. <laughs> Uh, from this table, please. We have a volunteer. Oh, before the next person goes, go ahead and get the mic, but before the next person goes, uh, I'm reminded of a saying we have up north in Las, about Las Vegas. What happens in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas. So since I'm asking you about something that you may not want to be, maybe a little reluctant to share, I want to ask that we all trust each other and promise not to talk about this, except in the context of how we can do better assessment outside of this session. Okay, so we just talked about lectures and we answered the questions for three courses and then we tried to see what was the common factor within these three things. And uh, compared to the Bloom's pyramid, uh, we believe that they learn it's in the bottom of the pyramid. I mean, which is repeated, like formulas, uh, understanding processes, things that are very like in the bottom of the pyramid. Then we agree that they have problems when they have to analyze, interpretation, these things, which positions maybe the top of the pyramid, these kind of concepts. So we believe that that's what we feel in our lectures. And when we answer the question, how do we know, the first thing we came up with was uh, the tests, the exams. But then we were discussing, and we had cases that, for example, someone was go to the exam, but when you discuss with him, he doesn't have a clue, he doesn't have an idea. So, not every time exams reflect the real knowledge of the people. When you interact with them, and maybe with practical, or when they ask questions, maybe we can determine if he really understands or not. So, uh, how do we know? By testing, but maybe tests, they are not always the, the good mean to know if they learn or not. Good point. A uh, good way to think about a test is it's what a student knows at that point in time. Exactly. This table, please.
Okay, one, one thing that we discussed here it was uh, we had the two very different uh, um, classes. He is a teacher from calculus and a teacher for computer architecture and um, systems engineer. So we, the, we saw this thing in, in our very specific areas. Uh, the teacher told us that he could achieve the relationship between the calculus of the so many variables with the with the surfaces and how to teach to the students uh, the importance of the of the calculus, not just focusing on the operative area. That's the the thing that he know was able to to achieve with the people. The, uh, the increase in the ability of the operatives and the calculus of the, the variables. And he got focused on the how to um, give the, the students the ability to interpret the data and how to, to understand what's the importance of that. He changed the, the way of the course, uh, how he works, and the he felt that the the objective that he got in his mind, not it was rated on the on the grades on, on the on the evaluations, and he achieved it because he he feels and he discussed with them that he was past certain something. Uh, he could uh, verify that they got the the answer. In my case, I have a, a course that uh, we changed last year to follow a, um, a way of data to, to give to the students that course working with projects. The procedure was uh, developed by Simon Schalken. I don't know if you know him. Uh, he has a, um, a course that uh, uh, teaches how to build a computer from the very, very low level of the electronics and goes up to the build in a simulation way, a computer, and passing with uh, through the all the process, uh, connecting the, the different chips and construct a, a very strong computer. And I, I feel that they know the objective, they achieve the, the, the objective of the, of the course and to understand how is the relationship between the hardware and the software and the computer. And the most important, the, re the reaction of them. Not based on the grades, because the grades, as the previous teacher says, sometimes not reflects the, the real state of the student, right? But um, I feel that the, the students got the idea and in the future will going to improve the relationship between the software and the hardware. I think it's the, the, the most important objective of my course. And I, ha I had the opportunity to, to take another course, and we felt in that course that the teachers don't love the course, because the, in that course I don't have that kind of uh, tools that makes the people love what they're doing. And some important thing I think is how do you give the, the, the students the ability to love what they are working on. That's great when you can do it. That's, that's something we should all look for. Um, because we're, we're a little, little down time, I'm gonna, I can take one or two more, but I just want to know if there, but I'm asking you to just uh, stick to one course or one person, one person's input, if you could. Is there anyone else who would really like to volunteer? Um, all right, how about that table? <laughs> Uh, we are from different areas, right. and, and as, uh, after a discussion about uh, our different fields, we are right. We wanted to arrive to to the same problem, and the problem that we saw is that well, we identified that the most of the students have the problem of synthesize and connect different ideas from certain area, and that's the learning goal. Uh, most of the time we saw that the student, uh, most of the student doesn't, uh, did not accomplish. And uh, how do 
you know, probably you realize that the student has something about that. Well, most of the time we make questions about we saw the last class, in the current class, and we saw that sometimes they don't, they don't connect ideas. So that's one of uh, the option that we do in order to, to identify. Also, we use or we made uh, small quizzes uh, at the end of the beginning of the class, and sometimes uh, we ask the student to make uh, maps that connect ideas or flowcharts. So that's another some of the activities that uh, we made in order to identify if the student are able or not to synthesize or to make ideas on a certain subject. I don't know if my partners want to add something. No, just one per table. Uh, we have room for one more. One last one. All right, I will skip that last one and just sort of summarize what I'm hearing. So it sounds like for the most part, your students are having trouble with the higher level skills on Bloom's taxonomy. The lower, they're getting some of the lower goals, but they're not getting some of the higher goals. And you're learning that from testing, from observing them uh, after, after uh, the course is over, from polling them in class, like we like uh, Rebecca was doing in the first session, which is very, which is actually a very good way to see what students are thinking uh, while before things are too late, uh, and from assignments and projects, and those are all good ways. But one of the things that we have to keep in mind as we start incorporating active learning. Now, some of you may only be looking at doing some small changes. And for small changes, this may not be necessary. But at some point, you may be ready for a larger change. And some of you, from when I'm talking to you earlier, are ready for that larger change. And so when you're ready to do a real redesign, what you want to do is to start with the performance outcomes. Basically, start with what you want the students to do. Then. Think about how you're going to assess the students to see if they're achieving your performance outcomes. Are they achieving your goals? And then once you have the outcomes and you have the, and you have the assessment, that's the time when you want to start thinking about how you want to teach, what, what you want to do with the students. How are you going to instruct them? What activities are you going to do with them so that they're going to be able to meet your goals. Now, I know when I started teaching, that's not the way I did it. Um, I started with the textbook, and I figured I was supposed to cover these chapters. And then, um, so my instruction came first. Then came, I had to write the exams. That's when I started maybe a little bit more, started thinking a little bit about my goals. And last came the performance outcomes. We want to turn that around. Because when you're talking about students and instructors, the, goal, the emphasis here is on what the students are learning. So that we, we have the way we start with the redesign of student-centered instruction is starting from what do we want the students to be able to do. Now it may turn out some things that we do in class may not be needed. It may turn out that some things that we want to do with the students may be more than we can do with the time that we have. These are all things that we need to keep in mind. Now. A good way to start with your performance outcomes is to look at learning objectives and competencies. Now, I talked with some faculty here about the terminology you use, because the terminology, unfortunately, you go to different websites, and they all have different terminologies. And if I'm way off base, just if you could let me know, that would be great. But my impression is, is that you're looking at this in terms of learning objectives, competencies, and outcomes. Raise your hand if those terms, or you at least heard those terms before. Okay, excellent. All right, why do we need them? They provide a focus for what we're teaching. They provide guidelines for what we want the students to learn. They provide targets for our assessments. Um, they will actually help us communicate our expectations to our learners. They'll uh, convey instructional intent to others. How many of you have ever tried to have um, a friend or a son of a friend or a daughter of a friend ask you about what do you think about this program at this school? And you go to the website and you look at the course descriptions and you try to figure out whether it's a good program or a bad program just based on that. 
Excuse it's generally me. not that helpful for evaluating the quality of the program. But if, say, for example, imagine what would happen if every course, if every program listed their, uh, their learning objectives and their competencies, how much easier it would be to be able to evaluate that program. And, then, and that's been, actually it's the last point already. OK, so sometimes different people mean different things when they say these terms. So uh, unfortunately, in education, there's a lot of terms like that. So I, sometimes I say, don't tell me uh, that you're doing this. Tell me what you mean by this. So here's what I mean by this. So when I say learning objective, I'm talking about a fairly general statement about the larger goal of the program or course that, uh, that we're talking about. Now, this objective may be very general, may be general because the general it may include multiple competencies. Now, the competency is where we start getting into the parts that I find my, my favorite part of the session. So, competency should be a very explicit statement of what the student should be able to do. It has to be something that you can measure or observe. Um, so, for example, if, if when you're writing out your competency, some words you might want to use are define, explain, calculate, derive, model, critique, design, evaluate. So basically, these are things. These are the goals you're going that you want to have for evaluating what your students are learning. <coughs> now, just as a learning objective may have more than one competency, a competency may have more than one measurable outcome. So one of my measurable outcomes might be that my students don't do well on nationally normed uh, assessments of their conceptual understanding, of how well they understand physics concepts in a basic form, a very low level on the, on the uh, Lumis taxonomy. Uh, but at the same time, I might want to evaluate how they do on my exams on higher level applications of those same concepts. That would be an example of two. Uh, Two outcomes. Now typically when we talk about a competency, we're really looking at three facets of what the students are learning. We're talking about knowledge, we're talking about skill, and we might be talking about ability. We already did that. Okay, so we already went through words. So a competency might begin with by the end of this lecture, by the end of this month, by the end of this chapter, by the end of the course, students should be able to, or to do well on the next exam, you should be able to. That's the way you, that's the way you want to phrase uh, your competencies. So here's some examples of good competencies. Um, now I tried to write, I was told that you'd be from a wide variety of different areas as you are. And so I tried to write my competencies to a similar, but I apologize. A lot of this is based on the work, work of, um, um, I'm like, I'm like, I'm not sorry. I'll go back to that reference later. Uh, but it's based from a specific work, and it was more to have to, it is geared towards STEM education because that is my main interest, so I apologize for that. But you can see how some of these would uh, work in other areas as well. So defined, moment of inertia, microeconomics, uh, photosynthesis, return on investment. I did try to do some modification. I have a handler in terms that your grandmother would understand, or a non-expert would understand, or someone outside of the class who hasn't taken the class would understand. My personal favorite is always the grandmother. Um, label, geographic features, engine parts, types of clouds, emission spectra, and a series of photos. All of our fields use diagrams and visuals of some kind. Describe how stem cell research might result in therapies for a new disease. Um, perform one-tailed and two-tailed hypothesis test, or basically, I think, imagine that as any method that you teach your students that they would apply in class. Interpret the themes and symbolism in Shakespeare's Macbeth. One of my personal favorites, critique an article in a magazine or newspaper that deals with the subject in this course. We actually have that as a stated goal in my university for our astronomy class. Now, whether you think about it or not, we all write competencies. We just don't call them that. As I said, when I started teaching, I called them exams. Um, but often, 
Well, uh, if we're not trained otherwise, when we first start teaching, it's when we write our exams that we first really start thinking about what is it that we want students to be able to do? What do we want them to get out of this section of the course? Or the entire course if we're doing a final exam? And when uh, that's too late. At that point, the teaching, the teaching and all the experience the students are going to have has already happened. So better to write the competencies first so we can think about how to teach the students the skills and knowledge they need to succeed. This is weird. Okay. All right. Now, when we write our competencies, what we're, what we're shooting for here is what we call constructive alignment. You want to review the knowledge you want your students to acquire and the skills you want them to develop in the course. And then you want to write detailed competencies that address those targeted knowledge and skills. So we want to review, we want to design. We want to design lectures, in-class activities, and assignments, in-class and out, uh, that illustrate and provide practice for all the targeted skills. I can't emphasize enough that everything that you want students to do, to be able to do, they need to practice. Um, in order, to, in order to achieve mastery. No one achieves mastery without practice. Now, they need feedback as part of that practice, too. But we'll get to that. And then we want to share the companies with the students. Um, ideally, a study guide for exams and other course assessments. And we should also refer to them in our lessons and assignments. So this week, we're going to cover these competencies. I'm not going to call them that. That's effectively what we're doing. Or we write a study guide. So when I write a study guide um, for my students, I usually give them the study guide seven to ten days before the exam. And I actually write out the competencies that are going to be tested on that exam. Now I put some other information there as well, including a practice exam. Um, but I make sure they're aware of exactly what I expect them to know and what I expect them to be able to do. And generally, I've talked to other instructors who've done that, and in the literature, we find that instructors who do that sometimes find that their exam performance actually goes up once it's clear to the students from the concept of study guide. We made, it, we made our, our expectations clear. The students have been better and now have more information about how to study and how to prepare for your exam, and they can actually be more prepared for your exam. Now you might say, well, isn't that cheating? And I used to feel that way. I used to be a little bit mixed, mixed in how I felt about that. But at the same time, I always kept my friend Scott, uh, who teaches at Rochester Institute of Technology, and he has a wonderful answer to this. Um, but he actually was an answer to something else, and that was, aren't you teaching to the test? And he said, that's the wrong question. And he's right. If we're actually doing our tests right, we should be teaching to our tests, because we should be teaching our students the skills and knowledge they need to succeed. The question is, is it a test worth teaching to? But that's a subject for another day. Um, so here's some things to think about when you're working on getting your, uh, your competencies aligned with your goals. And that is, if your assessments are showing that many students aren't meeting your objectives, your competencies, then we need to think about how to modify our lessons, our activities, and our assignments to provide even more or better practice and feedback in the task, in the task associated with that objective. And if you're a teacher, you already know this. I don't need to keep telling you that teaching is an iterative process. You're always thinking about, particularly if you're here, you're always going to be thinking about how can I do better next time. And this is an iterative process, and it may take several times of going through the process before you get your competencies well aligned with your course, and you have your instruction well aligned with your competencies. It's not an easy thing, but if you can do it, I think you'll see that your students will actually be able to do some of the things that you told me earlier that I'm not able to do. Okay. Two keys to effective competencies. Clarity and observability slash measurability. If we don't have those, then these aren't, these aren't going to be useful. Then the competencies are not going to be useful for us. So the actions they specify have to be clear to the students, and they have to be observable slash measurable by the instructor. So students have to be able to read it and say with confidence, I can do that. 
Or is it the same with Thompson? I can't do that. But so I can do that. Spare me with those other reasons. But the student can't just say that and say, I don't know. They should be able to read it and determine that that's something they can do or something that they can't do that they need to work on. And it's observable. It's measurable, so you can either watch the students doing it, see the results of having done it, or it can define an outcome that can be measured. And if you're not sure about the observability, then think about whether you actually have a competency or something, that, or more of, a, more of a broad, a general objective. Or think about, if you can't observe it, is this something that you really need to assess? Is this something that you really, that really needs to be a competence? Okay, now, as you're writing competencies, some bad words to keep in mind. So these, these are the evil words for competencies. We don't want to use the words know, learn, understand, or appreciate. Because think about this, how easy or hard is it to measure whether someone knows something, really knows something, not just the words, not just to repeat back a def definition, but really knows and understands something. Or have they learned it? Okay. Have they have learned it at some level, but at what level? Um, understanding is also very difficult to observe or measure, as well as appreciation. So all these are vital, these are very important goals. They're not suitable for competencies. And again, if you cannot directly you cannot directly observe students understanding um, at least most of us can. With a lot of video camera and a lot of time, you might be able to do that. But most of us don't have the time or the resources to be able to do that. So for the most part, we have to think we can't observe students understanding the concepts. And if you're wondering, I'm talking about you know, if you can actually observe students having a conversation about how they There's one way to do that. But it's, that's, a, that's a means that most of us just don't have. So asking a student to understand something on a test really doesn't make sense. So we already talked about Bloom's taxonomy. And was anyone not at the talk this morning? Really? I can't. A few people. OK. So Bloom's taxonomy is a way, um, a cognitive way to look at learning. So you can talk about learning a physical skill. That's not covered here. But in terms of things that we learn mentally, you know, with our brains, um, Basically, how we how we understand, how we know all these things, how we would know, understand, apply, synthesize, analyze, evaluate, create. Um, these are divided up, and the lower three are considered lower levels of cognition. These are basically things that are easier for students to do. And what you told me is a lot of your students are already doing. They're able to recall basic facts and concepts. They're able to explain, give basic explanations of ideas or concepts. They're able to use information in new situations in a new way. So those are the lower levels. And the upper levels analyze, draw connections among ideas, or be able to put information together, evaluate, just basically look at a situation, analyze it, and come to a standard decision or produce new or original work from the hardest things to teach students to be able to do. Now, the main reason I want to bring this up here is Bloom's taxonomy gives us some good words to use when we write, when we write our, our competencies. Words like define, list, identify, calculate, explain, paraphrase, interpret, and so on. Uh, derive, explain, predict, model, interpret, choose, prioritize, wait, critique, design, develop, plan, formulate. All good words in writing your competencies. And the upper levels have another word that we often use and we often have a hard time getting our students to achieve. This is what we this is often what we mean by those three upper levels by critical thinking. And teaching critical thinking skills, we're teaching students to do these things. Okay, this will be available to um, one of this will be available to view later. Okay, it doesn't take too much time to go through right now, so I'll just let you view this later. But this is just some examples of competencies using Zoom's taxonomy.
Now, when you're applying Bloom's taxonomy to your competencies, here's some things to keep in mind. If the course material is purely at level one, remember it, at least that aspect of course material, put it on a handout, include it in the study guide, and don't spend a lot of time on it in the lectures. This is stuff, this, this is material students can learn on their own. Um, include some level two items, in particular things where students have to explain things in their own words, um, things that students can, uh, may be able to apply without necessarily understanding them, so they can type the definition that if you push a little farther you might find that that understanding is very shallow. And this is the this is the part that we, based on what you were telling me, you're still having a hard time with the higher levels. Then we need to put some competencies in the higher levels and make sure that we include them. Does that mean we make all of our competencies in the higher level? No. But we want to make sure that we that we have some competencies in the higher level and we include some of those higher level competencies in our assignments and our exams and our projects. Okay. I told you I'm talking a lot more than I usually do. Right? Again, my apologies. So here's something that you can do. Here are three competencies for roughly the same task. I want you to talk in your teams and rank them on your whiteboards uh, from worst to best. Which is, the, which is the worst written competency and which is the best written competency. I'll give you three minutes. Actually, I'm going to suggest that if you erase, erase the how you knows. Do not erase your learning, your, uh, your learning goals. If you did, you did. But if you haven't, try and keep those. We're going, to, we're going to come back to this. <laughs> Actually, one moment before I let you before I let you discuss this more. Does anyone not understand what I mean when I say a ranking? Raise your hand if you do not understand what I mean by a rank. Excellent. Go to it. Pause. Pause. Time. Um, before you move on, I just realized I just made the same mistake twice. And I posted a question in English, and a lot of you get Some of you are finding it very difficult to read. So if it would help, I'm going to basically say what each of them says, and the interpreter will translate for you. So all three start with, by the end of the first set of experiments in this lab course, students will, number one, be able to design an experiment and analyze the results. Number two, be able to design and carry out an experiment to measure a dependent variable as a function of one or two independent variables and perform an error analysis of the data. Also, explain in terms a bright high school senior can understand the meaning of the experimental results. Um, high school would be a secondary pre-college student. Number three, learn how to design and conduct experiments. And the bottom says, explain what makes each competency good or bad. Or if you prefer strong or weak.
So please continue. All, all time, I'll call you together in two minutes. Okay, time. Let's come together. Parker's down. We're all poison. Okay, I don't think I heard it on this table before. I did? Oh, okay. So, can I have a volunteer to give me your rank? What was the worst? Oh, okay, we're going to go with this whole class. The thing in marker that works. Three. What was next? What was next? Okay. Anyone have anything else? From worst to best. From worst to best. Okay. What makes what made three the worst? Learn. Right. Good point. Okay. What made two the best? I have more specific. You have mixed feelings, okay? <laughs> um, let's see. People I have not heard from. How about over in the corner of uh, the team? It's five here. He's looking away. <laughs> <laughs> yes, welcome to the scale of room. Very hard to hide here. <laughs> but um, can you tell me why if, uh, number two might be the best? Best written competency here. We thought number two was the best because it goes deep into the detail of how to design and what to explain. Good response. And also how to measure. Good response. Anything else? Okay. What was, what made one weaker? What made one weaker? It's less, less specific. It's not specific. Maybe it's a little vague. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Now let's see if I learned my lesson. Okay. Again. Rank the competencies from worst to best. By the end of this course, you will. Number one, be able to function effectively as a team member on a multidisciplinary project team with effectiveness being determined by instructor observations, peer ratings, and self-assessment. Explain the roles of the different disciplines in the project and judge their relative importance. And that's the first confidence. The second would be by the end of this course, you will understand the requirements of multidisciplinary teamwork. And third, by the end of this course, you will be able to function effectively on a multidisciplinary project team. Go to it. How many teams need one more minute? Does any team need one more minute? Okay. This group very kindly volunteered. What was your ranking? Actually, hold on a second. Time. Let's cut the bring this together. Go ahead. Hello? The worst one is number three. It's number two, sorry, because it has one of those um, no-no words. 
Then, um, number three, and finally, number one. Number one is the best. Okay, what makes one the best? Because it has like um, the follow up, it gives the student a clear picture on how he or she will be evaluated, and um, it explains better how the, role, the competencies will be accomplished. Okay, so one is clearer and has more detail. Would two be a bad competency? Or a weak competency? It would be worse, but... Number two? Number two. I'm sorry, not number two, number three. Number, number two is evil. <laughs> It's very vague. How, how it's it's a, you're getting some help over here. Yeah, it is very. It, if, if you're functioning, right. It's very vague. It's hard to. You, it's not clear how you would judge that. Good. All right. Yes. Sure. Uh, we were discussing with about some disagreement about being two or three the worst competency here. Because in this case, at least competency two is this is built on a Bloom's word, like a verb, like understand. And it's, it's it's easier to measure. But in number three, when you just you're trying to measure like how someone functions effectively. So at least for not for the outcome, for, for the competency per se, I think it's worse field. Okay, I, I'm, I'm willing to go along with that, that it's debatable which one is. Um, as a general rule, I generally say if you use one of the words on the evil list, it's an evil competency rather than just a vague competency. But good point. Any other questions? On this or anything we've covered up to this point. And you may laugh when I say the word evil, evil, but when I do things like that with my students, I phrase things that way, they tend to remember it a little better. Yes, sir. Yes. But on a company. Exactly right. So on a on a obje learning objective, it's okay to use the evil verbs. It's generic. They're generic, right? But when you're defining a competency, when you're trying to get specific and uh, declare something that's observable and measurable, then you might avoid it. Sorry. Uh, so personal. So there's three levels that we can use this at. Now, when you're first starting with, a, if you're doing a whole course redesign, this would be a good place to start. The course level competencies. This is one extreme. The objectives can be very broad and cover in a few statements the knowledge and skills the course is designed to help is designed to help the students learn and uh, well, basically learn. Um, it's okay. You don't have to get into a lot of detail about the content at this level. Um, for the objectives. So for an example, students completing this course will be able to model physical systems with equations involving derivatives and integrals, solve those equations, uh, and apply the solutions to describe or predict system behavior. Now, if you have well-written course level objectives in a syllabus, this can indicate what the course is about far better than the typical course description. And this can be helpful for students trying to decide if this is a, if it's not a required course, it's going to help them determine if this is a course they want to take. Or help them judge uh, the quality of the course. Much better than a bull just a bull with a list of topics. Okay, then we go from looking at the entire course. It's not, it's perfectly appropriate to actually say for this lesson or for this class. Um, these are my competencies. 
Oh, sorry. They should be. They should be. They should be competency here, not objectives like that. Um, so a set of one to three lesson competencies written on the board at the beginning of class can help students anticipate what's coming, helps them keep focused during class, and provide a unique reference point for including summary. So, for example, as they're going through their notes. Um, as they're preparing for an exam, or as they're doing an assignment, it can give them very basically an index of where to go to get material that they need from their notes. So an example of this would be, uh, by the end of this session today, you should be able to write a good competency. Actually, that's too big. So by the end of the class today, you should be able to write a competency that is clear and is either measurable and observable. And would be clear and would be clear to the students as to whether they that's something they know or something they do not. Okay, and one of the things I like to do when I I typically give two midterm exams and a final exam, so the class sort of breaks up into thirds. I consider each of those thirds a section. You can define a section however you like. Um, and you can have section level competencies. I'm sorry, I did a search of you know, trying to get my verbiage together and then I apologize it did not work out. That should say competency instead of objectives in the first bullet. Um, but the competencies may also list student capabilities after a specified section of the course has been covered. Such as students who have finished chapter four, the text should be able to. Or to do well in the next exam, you should be able to. Uh, to do well in the next exam, you should be able to. Well, okay. Uh, actually, rather than my doing this, uh, you, sir, can you give me an example of something a student should be able to do uh, on the next exam? So this is just on your typical exam. You should be able to solve a real problem related to the motion of a particle in a linear relation. Nice. Okay, now section level objectives can play a powerful role in determining the quality of course and learning it produces. What I don't say here is why. Section level, sorry, section level competencies, not objectives. So whenever you see that word objective here, I'm actually mean objective, I meant competency. Section level competencies can be good for study guides for your students to help them prepare for exams. Or to give them an idea about what competencies they might need to complete a project. Uh, whether it's a recording project or a web project or maybe a design project. Practice. Okay. Practice improves skills and focused practice improves targeted skills. Now, in the book that I use as a reference for a lot of this material, the author talks about musicians and he talks about tennis players. And the point he wants he wanted to make about those is what you have your students practice is definitely at least as important as um, the amount of practice that you're giving. So for example, for a tennis player who has a good serve and a good forehand who is weak on their backhand, it doesn't make sense for them, that player, to spend the same amount of time practicing those three skills. It makes more sense for the tennis player to practice on her weakest skill, her backhand. So she might, for example, put half or more of her time practicing her backhand and put just enough practice on her other skills to maintain those. Uh, musicians typically work the same way. For a musician working a difficult piece, you don't go and practice the whole piece over and over again if you really want to get proficiency, or at least you want to get it relatively quickly. You focus your practice on the parts you're having difficulty with. And the same holds for our students. We want to target the practice on the things they're having difficulty with. So what we give them as assignments, what we let them practice, and give them as activities in class, should focus on the skills they're finding difficult. And that might be where we want to spend more, and that may mean we spend more of our class time on the higher level boom activities. Now, other thing to keep in mind is this is not just a good saying. This is not just good practice. This is actually physiological. Basically, the more information is rehearsed, the more students use a, a piece of knowledge or, or a particular skill, the stronger that basic, once you, do, once you start doing that, that creates a network of neurons in your brain. 
And the more you use that network, the stronger it becomes, the less effort it takes to recall that knowledge, to recall that skill, and the easier it is then to apply that knowledge or skill when requested. So this is one of the reasons why cramming sometimes does not always produce the results that students don't think it does, is because the cramming is just very quick practice and doesn't build that neural network the way that rehearsing over several weeks, practice over several weeks, would. Uh, would. And so basically, the more they get to practice, uh, the more knowledgeable or skillful your students will be. Okay, so what I'd like you to do is, um, I want you to pick, a, well actually, pick three, pick again, each group I'd like you to pick three of the competencies all right, three competencies for the learning goals you stated at the beginning of this uh, session. So I asked you what, you know, I asked you what learning goals were your students able to achieve last term? What learning goals were your students not able to achieve? I want you to take those goals and write them as competencies based on what we've learned. And I know some of you have said you actually have not started teaching yet, so pick something you would want your students to learn. Each person should get, I want each person to write one for their appeal. And put them on the whiteboard. Okay. case will be important to display the tense that you're trying to use with your students and to specify that it's only for teaching can and can't because you know that abilities can be asked for in different tenses and different ways so getting into the specifics of the competency will be important do you want to give us one of yours oh okay <laughs> So uh, this, this one is from uh, the calculus, so the student will be able to identify the graphical representation of directional derivatives on like daily, daily structures, like day to day structures, like buildings or sculptures.
Right, so I was like uh, focusing about the verb, and I remember I think the verb the verb was identify. Yeah. So I think identify is a verb in very low in the structure, maybe not uh, to do something else but identify. So after you identify, you can compare or you can uh, analyze. Okay, and yours? Can she read it? She can read it. Because <laughs> I think you'd have to read upside down otherwise. So why means a student will be able to use the concept of um, future money value <laughs> or time money but money value to take financial decisions. Okay, so they'd be able to get figure out, determine the value of uh, their investment in the future to determine whether it's worth investing now. Yeah, so something like that. Okay. I so <laughs> just keep it. Just keep, the thing I want you to keep in mind on these is the emphasis is, should be on clarity, measurable, or observable, and and it needs to be specific. All right, now. Move on. Uh, we don't have time for that. Okay. So here's an example of some competencies. So we start with a, so we might, some of you have been asking about how you go from objective to competencies and then to outcome, which is the part we haven't talked about yet. So here's an example of an objective. Students should develop a good functional understanding of physics concepts. Um, and for the competencies, that's a little vague. And we all, we all know that from the board and understand doesn't work very well for competencies. So we need to go beyond that. So students should be able to describe and explain physics concepts, including knowing where and when they apply. Um, they should be able to apply physics concepts when solving problems and when examining physical phenomena. So some situation is happening in front, in front of them as a demonstration, for example, or in a video. And they should be able to tell uh, tell you whether or not a particular concept is applied. Um, apply concepts in new contexts, so a context outside of which they were taught. And so on. I'm going to leave it there for the moment. So that might be an example of some of the competencies. Actually, I'm looking at some of these and thinking I could go a little more specific. Outcomes. So how do we measure outcomes? So I'm just going to do a couple here. So the students can give examples of so here's a physics concept in the second law, and I'm going to evaluate their understanding of this concept in an exam. So the question is, the students can give examples of uh, the second law, uh, or correctly use this next the second law when analyzing a physical example. Uh, student does not use Newton's second law in a situation where it does not apply. So that's something I can look for specifically. So the outcomes, so the competencies basically are like the hypothesis of your experiment. They're identifying what you're, they're, what you're going to try to measure, and the outcomes are the actual measurement levels that you're going to make. So here's an example I might use. So students can give examples of Newton's second law or correctly use Newton's second law when analyzing a physics example. So what we do, now you can make your categories by grades. You can make them in terms of unsatisfactory, satisfactory, and uh, excellente, or exemplary. And then you can set criteria for those. So in this case, I set my criteria for excellente at being able to identify, use, or define the second law 85% of the time. I consider satisfactory to be 70 to 85% of the time. And if they can't, have use, if they can't do that 70% of the time, that would be considered unsatisfactory. You could also consider how you would use this for an essay. Um, think about what you want in an essay. So you want to, you might want a coherent theme. You might want um, specific examples or evidence. You might want to uh, evaluate them on on their grammar, punctuation. You might want to grade them on the flow, how well the quality of the writing. So you might have different standards for your excellente, for your satisfactory, and for your unsatisfactory. And then you evaluate your essays based on that criteria. 
two last things. Last, um, first last thing is there are two types of assessment. And I don't have this on the slide, so I'm just going to write it on the board for you. Formative and summative. Formative includes evaluation. and feedback. Summative is only evaluation. So summative is sort of a final evaluation. So your final, the final grade your students earn, or your final uh, performance that your students earn, would be summative. That would be the sum of everything they learn during the term. Uh, formative is basically you're measuring along the process and giving feedback to the students and giving them opportunity to improve. Um, my favorite way uh, to describe this is that form is that imagine a cook cooking a meal. Formative assessment is when the cook takes the soup. Summative assessment is when the guest takes the soup. That's number one. Number two, one of the things that can really be that's very helpful for guiding um, your curriculum design and, your, uh, and rewriting your curriculum is basically that the more you know about your students and the more you know about what they know, the more effective you can be. So some of that formative assessment feedback and some of that feedback can come from their assignments and their homework and what you see them do in class. So you know this because I'm only around looking at your whiteboards. That is a form of formative assessment. That's giving me some feedback. And you're getting some, if you're actually reporting back to the class, you're getting some feedback as well. Um, on the assignments as well. But you can also, you can use those assignments as sort of as exploratory questions to see what students know on a particular topic. So for example, when I'm talking, when I'm teaching about force, the first thing I do is I ask students to brainstorm everything they know about force, and that way I'm learning about their ideas about force before I actually start applying my lesson. Or you can do just in time. You can give them a preparatory assignment where they actually have to send information back to you. And uh, Rebecca's going to be talking about that more tomorrow. Well, they'll send information back to you, and the reason it's called just in time is the students are basically writing about what they know about a topic you have not taught them anything about yet. And then if you, you review that feedback typically within 12 hours of when you teach, and that's why it's called just in time, because you take that feedback and you alter your lesson based on what the students are telling you about what they know and what they don't know, and more specifically what they don't know and what they're having difficulty with. Another thing you can do is give a conceptual quiz and just give them uh, participation credit. If they, do, if they do the quiz, they get points. If they don't do the quiz or don't take it seriously, they don't get points. And you can ask them questions to probe their understanding about something before you start teaching them. As again, the more, you know, the more we know about our students, the more effectively we can teach them, and the better we can design our curriculum. 